Good morning, almost good afternoon. Um, thank you for joining us today. I know that I'm holding a microphone, but you're not hearing it overhead, and that's because we have some people who are watching on the other end of the camera. Um, so when it does come time for Q&A, we'll pass around the microphone, um, one of those things just to kind of be cognizant of. But with us today, and I have a couple notes here, so. With us today, we have uh, Tracy Pennylight. She's an assistant professor and um, has relatively recently become the executive director for the Center of Student Engagement and Learning Innovations at Thompson River University. She joins us here um, with Helen Chen, who gave a presentation yesterday. We're really excited to have them up here. Um, I met both of them actually over the summer at a conference in Boston and had the pleasure of running with Tracy, actually, mm -hmm. along the Boston River. It was actually a, a wonderful experience. Um, today, she's here, and she is going to be presenting on Pathways for Learning and uh, Bridging curricular and co-curricular learning with ePortfolios. So thank you all for coming. And Tracy, I'll let you take it away. Awesome, thanks so much, Heather. Well, thanks so much for taking time out of your busy day to join me um, this afternoon. Um, Willie was asking the, a question about, is this a real bridge? And it's the design of a walking bridge um, in China, and um, I have the reference in, in my slides, which we'll, we'll share. Um, but I like it because it's designed on the idea of a Mobius ring, so that idea that it's sort of, you can twist it and turn it, but it's all kind of part of the same pathway. And, um, and I think that's a good metaphor for what um, learning looks like for lots of us, actually, and, um, and certainly in the students that I um, I'm working with at Thompson Rivers University, which is a, a campus very similar to your own. It's open access. We have students coming to us from all different backgrounds and walks of life at all different stages of their learning career. And, um, and so part of the, the work that I'll be talking about today is efforts that we're undertaking to really ensure that they get to take responsibility and have um, the opportunity to sort of chart their own pathway for learning on, on our campus, which um, is my attempt to sort of push the boundaries a little bit of what we do in our traditional university education to make perhaps make it more meaningful for life in the 21st century. So I thought I'd just spend a little bit of time giving you some background um, to the thinking um, around uh, the work that we do with ePortfolio Learning and where this idea for ePortfolios um, not really comes from but sort of where we're at with portfolio thinking today and um, and how that relates to innovation and engagement in in 21st century learning and then provide you with some thoughts on opportunities that I see for bridging uh, learning between the curricular and co-curricular context on our campuses and then um, give you some examples of the the actual project that we're undertaking on our campus so to set the stage, there's uh, this whole ePortfolio idea, which I know you've been engaging with and thinking about on your campus. Um, this comes out of some of the work that uh, we do. I'm the vice chair of the board for the Association of Authentic, Experiential, and Evidence-Based Learning, or ABLE. And we've been thinking through, um, with many of our colleagues, this whole notion of what is an ePortfolio. And when Helen and I started to do this work in the early 2000s, um, ePortfolios really were about the use of the electronic um, medium to start allowing students to make sense of and document their learning. And as Helen discussed yesterday, the E is really a given today. We don't really think about um, the electronic as being so important. And I would define that portfolio idea today as more about the process, so engaging students in thinking about um, their learning over time. Um, it's developmental. It's really a pedagogy that we employ in our classrooms in, in getting students to do that kind of thinking. And it's really about learning. Um, we really, I think, want to enable our learners to make connections and transfer the learning between and among contexts if we want them to be successful in, in, in the 21st century. And so, um, and that notion of creating their own pathway through their learning career, I think, is really central to that. So that's where my thinking around ePortfolios is, is today, rather than the electronic, as, as we used to think about it in the, in the past. Um, Obviously, this is important because, as you all know, our context for learning is changing in the 21st century. Um, we have new technologies that are really pushing boundaries for learning, and that notion that learning is everywhere. We're living in a globalized world. It's not enough to think about what's happening at the University of Alaska Anchorage, but you know, we need our learners to be thinking about what's happening elsewhere as well. So I think um, that opens up new spaces. Um, there's an increasing need for analysis and critical thinking skills because we 
have access to information everywhere. I think we really need to be training our students to make sense of that information, so really embedding digital literacy into our programs. And so just to give you a bit of background, I'm a historian by training and, uh, and, and have taught both in regular history departments and in interdisciplinary departments. And you know, when I talk about this with some of my colleagues, they're like, well, that's not really my job to um, engage my students in thinking about uh, digital literacy. Uh, and I, I actually disagree. I think it is our job, and um, we need to be able to embed that kind of thinking into our disciplines, regardless of, of what our backgrounds are. Um, we need to uh, find ways to help learners to make connections between the learning that happens in in uh, different contexts so that they can really demonstrate the knowledge, skills, and abilities that they are developing um, as they work through our programs. And that really, um, to me, speaks of the notions of reflection and action. So we want them to reflect on their learning um, as they're making connections, and we want to, them to do something with it, right? Um, so it's not enough to say, well, yeah, what you're talking about in history connects to my civil engineering class, but rather, what are you going to do with that knowledge once you've acquired it? How will you transfer and make sense of it? And um, we need to, of course, document that we are meeting the learning outcomes. Um, we have a culture of accreditation and assessment on our campuses and um, while I don't think that that should drive what we're doing, I do think that we should be making sure that our learners are developing the knowledge, skills, and abilities that we've designed for them within our particular course context. And um, uh, ePortfolios really provides an opportunity for us to make visible, authentic evidence of learning. So rather than just sort of have data that tells us a lot about the numbers and things, what does that authentic evidence look like when we provide them with opportunities to capture it in ePortfolios? Um, what's most important for learning today? Well, I already sort of alluded to this notion. Um, and this is from Carol Geary Schneider, and I'll just read it for you because I know the, the fonts are a little bit dark. Um, so Carol, as you probably know, is the president of the Association of uh, American Colleges and Universities, or AACNU. And she says the most important aspects of a high quality education are broad, big picture learning, cutting edge scholarly inquiry, deep engagement with hard questions, and evidence-based reasoning. And I think um, that makes a lot of sense to me in this context. Um, Sarah Stein Greenberg, who's the director of Stanford's design school, or the D School, um, asks the question, what are our students' missions as part of their Stanford <coughs> 2025 work where, where they're really revisioning what does the university look like in the future? And I love this notion where we are maybe moving beyond, you know, what am I going to major in? <coughs> to what do I want to do with the rest of my life. And Helen talks a lot about, you know, the jobs that we're preparing uh, students for may not even exist yet. And so how can we um, allow for students to think through what might they want to do in the future that's part of a mission as opposed to part of their, their major. Not to say that I don't want students to uh, think about history as a major. Of course, that's a, uh, an important discipline for me. But I think I want them to be asking, how can I use that historical thinking um, to serve in other kinds of ways once I graduate? Um, this is all wrapped up in the notion of integrative learning, which is not a new concept. In fact, this quote comes from Mary Taylor Huber and Pat Hutchings from 2004. They wrote a, a little booklet called Integrative Learning, Mapping the Terrain. And they talk about integrative learning um, in this sense. They, they note that one of the greatest challenges in higher education is to foster students' abilities to integrate their learning across contexts and over time. So obviously, I've been very influenced by this. Um, they say that learning that helps develop integrative capacities is important because it builds habits of mind that prepare students to make informed judgments in the context of their personal, uh, professional, and civic life. When I think about what I do in um, higher education today, that's what I'm really trying to get at. I want my learners to leave not only my classroom but my campus prepared to um, tackle um, complex issues, to tolerate ambiguity, to be able to work and value others from different perspectives so that they can really effectively engage in civic life. Um, I think our students are the future of the world. 
I think we have a huge responsibility to make sure that they are um, well equipped to make sense of that, you know, rapidly changing and, um, and complicated uh, landscape that they'll enter as uh, citizens once they leave our campus. Well, they're citizens when they are on our campuses too, as well, but, um, but I really want them to be able to wrestle um, with those problems and to make sense of them in, in a way that will help them to contribute back to um, our world. I often say, you know, if we don't do a good job on our campuses, we're going to be stuck with some folks who are perhaps not best equipped to manage those problems. And so I think we really do have an important uh, job ahead of us. So if we think about this notion of engagement for learning, the engagement premise itself suggests that with ongoing study, uh, increased subject knowledge, practice, and feedback from faculty, and I would add peers, um, students gain deeper understandings. And so if we're thinking about designing really effective learning experiences for our students, how would we engage them in these kinds of practices? Because when we do that, um, and this comes out of the work from the National Survey of Student Engagement, George Koo and his colleagues, um, they argue that students then become more adept at managing complexity, tolerating meta ambiguity that we see in the world, and working with people from uh, multiple and different backgrounds so that they really do value others. And I think um, when I think about the work that's happening here at UAA um, in Native Student Services, they're doing some really interesting or about to uh, do some interesting uh, e-portfolio work that really thinks about um, the student as a whole and how can portfolios help us to not only allow them to be more engaged, but to celebrate um, the values, cultures, experiences that they bring into our classrooms and that are a part of, of their whole self. I like that notion that they use of becoming aware. Um, and so how can we open up space for our students to become aware of who they are, what they value, um, what kind of learning they bring into our classrooms. And I think we sometimes think about them as a blank slate. And yet when they come into our classroom, they've already learned lots of stuff. Um, how can we help them to make connections between those various things. So um, there are lots of opportunities for innovation and engagement in this landscape, I think, and this comes from the Connect to Learning project that was um, started with by a LaGuardia Community College, and their research uh, notes that successful e-portfolio initiatives really do advance a reflective and integrative social pedagogy for e-portfolios. So there you see that process and pedagogy um, idea coming out again that aims to build student learning and help students author new identities as learners. And I think this is really what we are all about, thinking about who are you as a learner and what does what you're learning here um, connect to um, the rest of what you want to do. So I think there are opportunities for collaborative partnerships and certainly here at UAA um, there's lots of evidence of that happening which is really exciting. Um, opportunities for interdisciplinary learning. I think um, e-portfolio work often gives us an, a chance to think about how we might connect with others who are doing similar kind of work or perhaps um, training their students to meet similar kinds of outcomes in different disciplines. Um, one of the most rewarding experiences that I had, I was teaching in an interdisciplinary program called Sexuality, Marriage, and Family Studies, and I had a, a friend who was teaching in religious studies, and we realized, um, and her course was called Sex and World Religions, and we realized, oh gee, you know, we're, we're addressing some of the same kinds of outcomes, maybe we could get our students together for a class and then maybe we could design an e-portfolio activity where they were reflecting on what did it mean to, to engage with students who were in a different disciplinary context and who also were thinking about um, sexuality in, in different contexts. And wow, what a rich experience that, and then beyond the, the two uh, classes meeting, the students also had all these other connections and so we saw these fantastic webs of intersection around the different students from, uh, from different perspectives which was quite exciting and um, had we not been using portfolios we wouldn't have seen that evidence you know we she and I may have got a glimmer of that on a on the answer to a test question um, but the portfolios really made that um, learning visible which was quite exciting um, we can also engage in flexible and lifelong learning approaches and so I think um, by its very nature e-portfolio work um, celebrates and fosters that notion of lifelong learning. Um, we want to inspire our students to think about learning not just while they're here, but also beyond. Um, and then student-centered uh, teaching and assessment. And I'll share with you some examples of the ways that I think this notion of bridging really does celebrate um, those two areas. 
So why would we want to bridge, uh, you know, between the curricular and co-curricular spaces or we might think about academic affairs and student affairs and um, I think it's because there are really neat opportunities for learning. The first idea is that bridging really focuses on learning in all its forms and you can see lots of different bridges here. They all are similar in some way but they also look um, different. I almost feel like this is kind of a Sesame Street type slide which some of our learners might not even know what that is anymore but, um, oops. Uh, but you can see that the bridges all have um, lots of similarities but also interesting differences as well and I think our students are that way as well. Um, they might all sit in a classroom just as you are in rows um, being uh, prepared to take in the information, but they all come to us with uh, different knowledge, skills, and abilities that sometimes go unnoticed if we don't ask them to, uh, to think what those are. Um, bridging really requires time and space. And I think this is perhaps one of the most important aspects of some of the work that we do um, with faculty is how can you build in opportunities for time and space for students to really reflect on, ooh, this is very sensitive, Helen, <laughs> and, um, and make connections to that learning that happens in different contexts. Um, we live in a really busy world. I'm sure many of you are constantly running between things. Um, I know our students are doing that as well. Um, they're often working, they have families, um, and, and doing lots of other stuff. Sometimes they're involved in athletics or whatever it might be. Um, to build in opportunities for students to really reflect on those connections, to really understand what it is they're learning, to ask questions is so essential in our busy life and so I think um, this is a really important component of, of what we do. Um, I would advocate that bridging promotes learning for change. When we, when we give students that opportunity to make connections, to bridge the learning that happens in different contexts, we also open up space for them to explore that question, what's my mission? Um, I'm not even touching it. <laughs> um, I'm going to put it down. Um, this is, it must be my electric personality that's uh, causing those things to happen. Um, we give them opportunities to really think not only what's my mission, but what am I going to do um, when I leave the classroom? How can we open up spaces for them to, to consider those um, exciting opportunities? So why a bridge? Well, learning happens in places other than the classroom. And I have to say, growing up as a, as a historian, um, really I thought learning that happened in, the, happened in the classroom and also maybe in the archives, you know, when you go and you find new documents and things. Um, it's moving on its own. <laughs> it's, not, it's, not, it's not even me, okay. I don't know why there's a timing, anyway. Um, so we'll just, yeah, try and make it stop. Um, <laughs> Um, you know, we really want to think about what happens in other contexts. And um, so here on the right hand side, you see a report that recently came out from the Lumina Foundation, which is all about connecting credentials. So what kinds of learning is happening? How are students being um, recognized for their learning in other contexts? On the left is a portfolio where, again, students are having an opportunity to do this. Um, and, and as I said, as a historian, you know, I thought about learning that happened in the classroom and certainly back in the Middle Ages when I was uh, taking classes, that is primarily where it happened. We really didn't do a whole lot of uh, co-curricular stuff that got brought into the classroom, but students today do. And I think it's a really easy thing for us as faculty members to ask, where else are you learning? What other connections are you seeing to what we're doing in this class um, with other things that you're doing? And students, I have to say, most of the time, tell me, mm, I don't think I'm allowed to do that, right? I'm supposed to just focus on what we're doing in here. And I say, no, no, it's okay. Um, tell me, are you working where you're using some of this information? Um, does it come into play when you're at home with your family? Um, are there other classes that you're taking? And as soon as I open up that space and opportunity, students do make connections when they feel like they're able to. And connections that I would never imagine. Um, and so that's really exciting. And the other exciting piece about that is they share with each other. And so, you know, I've had students say, oh, I should take that sociology class. Or, gee, I didn't know that I could get involved in an internship um, related to what I'm interested in studying in the future. And so you start to get that collaborative opportunity, which is really um, quite exciting. Um, you know, this idea that um, making connections really fosters transformative learning for students. This is actually an e-portfolio from Stanford um, in, in, in a program that Helen runs. Um, uh, la, 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 a portfolio, portfolio to, to Professoriate. Oh my gosh. And um, 
And you can kind of get a sense here of where this particular student is, is given, have, had an opportunity, you know, uh, talks about vocation is the place where your deep gladness meets the world's great hunger. And that's a quote from someone, but you know, where they're thinking about how can I use the education that I've uh, gained here at Stanford to connect to lots of different things, which is quite exciting. Um, and Bridging uh, by Learners uh, also fosters transformative learning for instructors. So if, if any of you have ever heard me talk before, you will have seen this slide. Um, this is a portfolio that came out of the very first class that I taught with ePortfolios. It was a history class called um, History 200 or History in Film. The students uh, lovingly referred to it as Monday Night at the Movies. And the chair asked me to take on the class to make it more rigorous. So I had students coming from across the disciplines in lots of different contexts, not going to be history majors. And I thought, you know, how can I make this more relevant for them? How can I ensure that they're going to take something from this class and transfer it to another context? And so I decided to focus the course. The theme was Cold War America, because there are great films and lots of good things you can discuss in that context. Um, but I decided to really uh, think through what does it mean to think historically? And I modeled the class around what we do as historians in practice and, and helping them to develop those skills. And so what I got were portfolios where students said, oh, you know, I'm in civil engineering and we don't actually do historical thinking, but we do undertake a process of critical thinking and analysis that's similar. And so here's how I'm transferring what I learned in History 200 to some other contexts. This ePortfolio is from a student who went on to, to major in history. And even though he was really keen on history, he got to the space where history is more than about books. You know, that's what he'd learned as a high school student, and he, it allowed him to take, as he describes it, a more holistic approach to the discipline where he looked at sources differently and asked critical questions about, <coughs> can I use a contemporary film as a source for doing history? Which is an interesting question because um, most of us would, at the, on the surface, say, no, that's, that's not what you do. Um, and, and so I thought this was um, quite exciting um, to hear him talk about the evolution of, of his critical thinking, to make connections to uh, trips that he'd gone on with his family where he'd visited historical sites and started to rethink how could I use that in terms of informing my interpretation, which is probably the number one skill that uh, history students have a hard time with because they think history is a narrative not their interpretation. It's hard to get them to that stage where they understand, oh, you mean I can interpret history myself? Um, so it, it was quite exciting. And so really transformative to me, for me, because I got to see the thinking that underpinned um, their final assignments, which was the portfolio. Um, this is a, 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 an image from Stanford, which is really Helen's image to sort of map out what the pathway through an undergraduate learning career um, looks like and, um, and really use this to sort of say that we need to make sure that learners have opportunities um, to really think about who they are as learners across the learning career. And um, when Helen talks about this, um, this image, she talks about where are the spaces where we might provide students with opportunities to do that kind of thinking. And, and so I think in our own context, it's really important to think beyond our individual courses to programs, et cetera, for where we might provide them with opportunities to think about the development of their identity as learners um, in our courses and beyond. Um, the next slide is, you know, here are our students in rows in the box of the classroom, um, and yet which is the challenge for us because that's the setup that we have, much like you're sitting here, but we know that those learners are learning in lots of other spaces. And so, yet, what we really have in the classroom is the professor that takes over it all, right? It's all about us, <laughs> typically. Um, and, and where do we, again, ask that question, what connections are you making? It's so easy. So to give you a sense of um, bridging for transformative learning, this is some ePortfolio work that's happening on my campus. And um, again, when we open up that space, you know, you get a student like Haley saying, wow, readers of my portfolio are treating me like the expert, right? Simone is talking about how her perspective on Canada as a global leader changed because of some of the courses um, that she's taken at TRU and the experience that she gained studying abroad. 
And we see how this really fits into that notion of essential learning outcomes where we can really think through what does this mean for us in terms of um, our instruction, what outcomes are we trying to meet, how can we build in these experiences um, for our students, and what kinds of artifacts or evidence might they produce in their portfolios that are different. So, you know, I've moved away um, fairly substantially from traditional research papers in my courses to looking at what are some of the other kinds of artifacts um, and evidence that students can create. Um, in that history and film class, I opened up an opportunity at that stage still you know write a research paper if you like or you could um, create a creative assignment and I you know sort of basically that had to address um, the outcomes for the, the research assignment I got films I got songs I got all kinds of different representations of the students interpretation of historical thinking just by opening up space for different kinds of evidence and so I think that's um, quite exciting for us in our work. So if we want to think about creating pathways for learning, what might that look like? Well, on my campus, we have a real diverse set of students, as I mentioned. We've got everything from vocational uh, areas like trades and technology, uh, culinary arts in the center, through to a faculty of law and graduate programs. Um, so I think we really want to make sure that we have opportunities for learners to become agents of their learning and identities and to sort of chart their pathway that might look quite convoluted and as individual students it will look different for everybody. Um, the learning in portfolios I think opens up space for that um, as we, we give students opportunities to think through where are those various connections happening and I thought it might make sense for you just to have a quick listen to what that looks sounds like from the students themselves. I thought, oh, I'm going to have lots of pictures, I'm going to have lots of this and lots of that, and it was not the case. <laughs> I wasn't excited at all, <laughs> honestly. <laughs> yeah. So I thought, okay, uh, am I going to have enough time to devote to this? I really did not know what to expect. My expectation was challenging. Am I have enough information and experience to showcase what I have? I was quite discouraged in the beginning, actually. <laughs> I realized like how much I can actually achieve with it. It gave me the opportunity to like actually look back on my experiences. It's personal, it's your own self. I didn't expect all of the opportunities that I, that came out of it. Anything that you've ever done in your life, any volunteer work, career, um, what you're taking in school, and it's a process of self-reflection. I started thinking of things, artifacts that I could grab from home to photocopy and put on, and thinking of different posts that I wanted to do. Different people sharing their um, the ways how they built the e-portfolio. We met on a mostly weekly basis. And we just getting more and more ideas. Oh, I want to include this, I want to include that. I'm not the only one interested in the topic. It's everyone else is, is even more interested than I am in some cases. And they want to know more. And they're treating me like the expert. Mm -hmm. Focusing more on just like the reflection aspect of it. And it actually helps you like reflect on what you do. Wow, I totally forgot that I these are what I have done so far. We're really proud of the work that we've done and we want to share it with Thompson Rivers University um, staff and students. And now looking back and say I'm glad that I did it so that I can always have something to look back to and show other people and say this is what I have accomplished. And I will not stop there. I will still continue working on my e-boards for you. Thank you. My name is Tatiana. Tatiana Siang. Brianna Makwa. Haley Jean Lindgren. Dexter Armstrong. Kathy Munchetta. Haifa Bizafira Golapan. So you can hear that when you give them an opportunity, you know, initially it's, and, and certainly we've seen that here too, some of the students are like, oh, that's overwhelming. What am I going to put in there? How do I make connections? That it really is a development, um, developmental ability. And so when we're designing um, learning experiences, really making sure that we scaffold for the learners uh, those various things so that we, we can address some of those concerns like, do I have do I have anything to put in there? You know, what, 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 would I, what would I put in there to showcase who I am and to document who I am as a learner and, and who I am as a person? Um, they talked about the process, you know, that opportunity to look back on their experiences. And I loved um, Haifa at the end says, you know, and I'm going to continue to do my portfolio. You know, this is not something that is a one, 
one-time standalone kind of activity, but it's something that we want to develop those habits of mind in our students. And again, going back to Haley, that notion that um, readers of the portfolio treat me like the expert, and they are experts on themselves as learners. Right? And they need our feedback and guidance around where there are opportunities to continue to develop. But at the, at the end of the day, it's about them. It's not about us sort of saying, fit into my history box or um, whatever it might be. Um, so in this idea, we really wanted to allow our students to develop a sense of their own pathway through um, their learning at the institution around five areas that actually are our strategic priorities. So student success, intercultural understanding, undergraduate research capacity, entrepreneurial capacity, and sustainability. So you can imagine words like entrepreneurial capacity and sustainability and some uh, contexts are a little unclear. You know, if I talk to my colleagues in the history department, well, we don't do entrepreneurship, so people often think about entrepreneurial meaning business. Um, and I think really what the campus was aiming for is thinking to entrepreneurial and, and employing those entrepreneurial mindsets to the kind of work that we want to do. So if we want to develop uh, students in terms of these five areas, which incidentally map to our uh, institutional uh, graduate attributes, um, what could that look like and where is that space for them to do that? So we started thinking about um, the TRU grad in the center of, of all of these priorities and thinking about what would it mean if they were discovering some of those priorities, if they were making connections between them, if they were experiencing them, oh it's doing it again, and if they, and if they become. And so this idea that we want the learner to really tell us where they're at at different levels um, in order to be successful. So I think in, in that idea, the value proposition for learners is that they get some choice over their uh, own path and through their learning career. So it's not about come in and do these, the, check off the boxes that we say you should check off for a particular degree or whatever. <laughs> um, it gives them opportunities to be recognized um, for the knowledge, skills, and abilities across their learning experiences, which is where the bridging comes in, um, and really fosters that notion of lifelong learning and professional growth and development. For us as educators, I think the value is um, that when we give opportunities for this bridging to happen, uh, great things go on. Uh, you know, we, we can't anticipate what that might be. Um, which I think for some people feels a little bit risky. I, I actually think about um, the opportunities that come out of not quite knowing what connections the students will, ha uh, will make. That's not to say we don't need very clearly defined learning outcomes. We need that really good alignment between the outcomes, the learning activities, and the assessment strategies. So we need to do all of that thinking up front, but then we can think through what types of evidence actually meet the outcomes, and that's sort of where we're going with this program. So, um, how will it work? Well, um, what we've done is we've developed uh, clear learning outcomes for each of the levels and along all of the strate strategic priorities for our learners. So, for instance, in the outcome, uh, one set of outcomes you probably can't read. Um, for instance, ask in, so this is the research capacity, ask in, at the connect level, ask in-depth and increasingly disciplined specific questions about a topic of interest compare and contrast samples of existing knowledge, research, and or views, identify problem-solving strategies and methods appropriate to a research project, et cetera. Um, we've worked collaboratively with folks who are in those areas. So for instance, our Vice President of Research and Grad Studies has worked closely with us on developing those outcomes. Um, we're also working with faculty members in uh, different schools and divisions so that we ensure that what we're sort of putting in there makes sense to them. So the idea is that a student can come in at any point in the pathway and basically provide evidence in their portfolio that they have met the outcome. We'll assess it um, in an interdisciplinary way and then decide whether a student has, has, will receive that credential. And so we're envisioning that students will be able to get badges. Um, we don't want students to fill up the matrix. So we're not expecting students to hit every level 
of every priority, um, but rather we want to open up space for them to sort of decide where are the areas that I really want to work on and how do I want to get some credit for that, um, for that learning that happens. I'm envisioning that we may have high school students, traditional age students coming in who've had the opportunity to do a community service learning abroad. They're probably not going to be at Discover Intercultural Understanding because they've had some experience with that already. They may come in at Connect or Experience with the evidence that they have to meet that, that particular set of outcomes. We have a really rigorous undergraduate research program on our campus and so we want to provide opportunities for students to develop those uh, skills and abilities as they come in. Similarly, if I have a mature student who's coming back to finish their degree who's been a professional, they're probably not going to be at the bottom of entrepreneurial capacity. We want to open up space for them to get recognized for the skills and knowledge that they're bringing into the university. But they may need to start um, more at the beginning for student success because maybe they haven't been in a classroom for a long time. And how can we document that and open up space for them to develop those skills and abilities really effectively? So for example, we might have uh, an ePortfolio that looks a little like this. This is a fourth year a geography student in a Bachelor of Arts program. Um, her mission is work in an NGO abroad, so we're opening up space for them to think about that. They're a transfer student um, from another university and they're involved in diverse learning opportunities. So the evidence might include a reflection on uh, our learning styles inventory and what that meant for her. So that's more the discover student success. Um, she might have evidence of a high school community service learning, so she might have photos and a reflection, which was evidence of connect intercultural capacity. Uh, maybe her undergraduate research uh, poster, which is more um, discover undergraduate research um, or experience. Uh, Co-op work experience, which again might be at the experience level, and then a geography field trip where she's really becoming the person that she wants to be as she works toward that um, working in an NGO abroad. So you can kind of see how these portfolios will look very different depending on how a student wants to develop their, their pathway. So what are some of the implications for bridging? And I get asked these questions all the time, how are you going to do this? Um, I think we need to engage all members of our communities to support these learning pathways. Um, we're working really um, diligently to connect with faculty across the schools and divisions, um, to work with staff in our um, student affairs units to make sure that we're able to articulate and work with them um, and understand what evidence might look like and to also set experiences up for students whereby they're actually creating evidence that uh, will help them document. Um, we need obviously pedagogical support for um, faculty and instructors around notions of adaptive learning, experiential learning, Learning, um, to make sure that we really set people up for success in doing this kind of work. Um, assessment strategies obviously need to be developed, so what we're envisioning at this point, I mentioned that we have um, developed rubrics, although my team is very stressed about the rubrics um, and want to make sure that they're really um, going to work, and I've sort of said, well, you know what, let's get a, real, a sense of what we want them to look like, but at the end of the day, until we start seeing evidence, we really won't know whether or not the rubric's appropriate, so we really want to work with the students themselves to make sure that we're communicating that effectively. Um, and similarly, uh, we'll want to train our staff and faculty to work on teams to do that kind of assessment so that we can um, sort of award those credentials where uh, necessary. Um, and we need to think about scalability. We have about 12,000 students on campus and about the same number of students who are fully online. So what will this look like as, move, as we're moving forward? And so we're thinking through some of those strategies to try and um, to make sure that we address all of the um, interesting opportunities that will arise as, uh, as a result of doing this work. So we're quite excited about it. Um, I think it does really um, give us an opportunity to sort of weigh into that conversation that's happening in higher education today about the various types of learning that happens in MOOCs with credentials and badges, um, you know, how we will think about education moving forward. And I think the other opportunity here is really to work with faculty um, and staff across the campus to design some neat programs that might address pathways in unique ways. So I'm envisioning that we may package together, for instance, our first year co-op career course, which is actually a one credit course with 
perhaps three to six credits in, in different academic disciplines. We have a, a credential in global competency. So how might we package some of those things up to give students added value and allow them to sort of identify where they want to be on that pathway? I think there's some really neat opportunities for, um, for future work that goes beyond, you know, just sort of redesigning curriculum in, in a kind of a traditional uh, way. So I think when we do that, um, we might get to um, experience the joy of learning together, and I think that's really what we should all be about um, at universities. So I hope that's piqued your interest, given you some ideas, and look forward to the conversation with you. Thank you. So again, just a reminder, we do have some folks online, and um, if any questions come in from there, we will kind of go that route. But in the meantime, if, when questions come up, if you want to raise your hand, and I'll pass the mic to you, um, and this will get. Yeah, I, I usually have something to say about everything, but. I'm, I I'm, love it, Bruno. <laughs> I, uh, I'm very happy that you stress the importance of uh, learning as a process, because um, you know, I think that that's what it is, and for the longest time, we kept thinking of it as a product mm -hmm. in some respect. But uh, also, the, the very important point that you bring about uh, connection uh, in the example that you gave is such an important one because we have spent so much time teaching courses in ways that often don't relate. We tried with a capstone, for example, yeah. to integrate this, but that's been very, um, ineffective. For example, I'll have a student come in and I'll say, didn't you take that course? And they said, yeah, I received an A in it. Yeah. And I'll say, well, why can't you apply what you learned here over here? Mm -hmm. Because no one ever asked them to. Yeah. Nobody asked, what is the connection? Yeah. Because they, don't, they take courses as individual things without ever seeing what it is. And I think that's what the e-portfolio, if you call it for me, a, a revolution or a a movement, a change in the way pedagogies thought about these days, both as lifelong learners and so forth, is in this issue of uh, being able to articulate what it is that you're doing. How could you go anywhere without a map, mm -hmm. for example, mm -hmm. that you're wandering blindly, mm -hmm. aimlessly, without ever having reflected on even why you're here and, and what you do? I think we should have been doing that uh, from day one. Mm -hmm. But I, it's a wonder how people haven't been damaged by our educational <laughs> system in a way that has taught them these very uh, discreet experiences and have not looked at the bigger picture or, or talked about learning. So, I mean, if you're talking to the choir here or singing to the choir. Thank yeah, you. and I know, and I know that you do really great, um, a really great job of this in your own classes. And I think when we went to university, it was a different world, right? We didn't have access to the internet. We didn't have access to information all day, every day. Um, you know, and I, th and and we weren't working. I mean, I did have a part-time job, but it was there wasn't the same pressure. I think on us. I, I remember going to university because I thought, what a cool opportunity, and I. I hate summer because I'm not in school, so I'd like, I want to go to school. Well, you know, now there's a lot of pressure for students to come to get a job. But again, what is that job going to look like? We probably can't predict. However, we can make sure that they're learning those skills and transferring knowledge between uh, contexts. It shouldn't be what happens in a classroom stays in a classroom. And we really don't want our students practicing intellectual bulimia take it all in, purge it on the final exam, and then move on, right? So how can we give them opportunities to, to make those connections? And um, I think what you're speaking about is one of the first projects we worked on when I used to be at the University of Waterloo around ePortfolios where similar kind of case professors were saying, well, the students were supposed to take that that, that prereq course, why, and you know, do you know how to do, no, we've never heard of that before. And the professor would say to the first professor, what's going on with you? Why didn't you teach students that stuff? Well, I did, right? And so using the portfolios to capture some of that knowledge, so then the, the second professor could say, now go back to your portfolio where you've thought this through and let's, let's ex extend it, right? Um, so there are so many interesting uses for portfolios. Yeah, well, one quick thing too that, that I wanted to mention is that we spent the last four or five years trying to get ePortfolio on this campus. It finally came to be. Uh, but one of the aspects that was difficult is the resistance from other faculty who haven't seen the light yet, who are 
still <laughs> doing the way on their old copy stain papers that they've had for years or whatever. Maybe they've adapted to PowerPoint, let's not play that. But the thing that frustrates me is that faculty need to have these conversations and they're very hard to have. Yep. It's not just about letting go of old ways. <laughs> it's about reevaluating what you're doing, why you're doing it, mm -hmm. and how would you know you've done it if you saw it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's a very, that's what we should be doing all the time. But, it, uh, you know, I'm getting ready to retire and I'm getting at the end of my, my uh, academic career and I'm thinking, what has all this been about? Why haven't we been doing this yeah. for so long? Did it take technology to allow us to do this? Is it, did it take the technology to permit us to start thinking in different ways, perhaps? Whereas before, we felt we were the knowledge givers mm -hmm. and they were the receivers. Uh, but as we mentioned, and I, I'll stop talking, is the issue of it was always top down. Mm -hmm. And it's with the advent of online teaching that I saw bottom up. Yeah. That's what it's about. It's the authenticity of the learner. It's about the learner. It's not about the teacher. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, and I, I, I think um, we have a really important role to play as experts um, in our disciplines in terms of helping this, the, the learner understand um, how and why they'd want to study in our discipline and what they can do with that, that knowledge or those skills and abilities. Um, <laughs> But I think you're right. I mean, I think it is, we're in a, a, a climate now where we really are focused more on the learner. And what I like about this approach is that it really is situated in the learner and, and, and celebrating the fact that the learner um, can take some control and responsibility over their learning. Now, let's be honest, um, traditional students anyway haven't been taught to do this, right? So w there are some challenges ahead. Um, we're going to need to help them develop those skills and abilities over time. Um, we know from research that we've done that reflection is a developmental ability. Students need practice. They need feedback on that work. Um, so that all has to be built into the system. Um, but I really believe that if we have faculty members across the campus asking students the question, how does this connect? we provide spaces for them to do that, then I think we really will see a difference in the graduates that we're turning out. Um, not that our graduates are bad, it's just can we be even more intentional with them? Um, yeah. Hi. Uh, I thought colored acetates were the golden bullet for education. <laughs> so, I'll go back a little further. Uh, and and uh, Bruno is absolutely right about, uh, he and I agree with about everything. And he's my mentor for that. Uh, but he has graduate students who help him with his uh, e-portfolios. Mm -hmm. I don't. Right. And, and so I always like to ask this question of our experts who come in. Uh, if you have a class of 10 or 12, you can reflect with those people, sit down and do a group hug about these reflections <laughs> and all this kind of stuff, and, and, and really get them and motivate them and on and on. Sure. But you have an intro class of 65 or 70, or even a upper division class, say, of 40, yeah. you know, where I, I, we need, I think we need some practical advice here on if this is going to work, mm -hmm. you're, you're going to have to institutionalize this in the sense of class size or, or something, graduate students or whatever. Yeah. So I, I'd like to hear your, your comments here on the practical nature of using this. And I, I assume that some of these people were doing this uh, uh, volunteer-wise, and mm -hmm. that I'd like to hear that. But if, if we're going to use it in a class, it's a purpose, it's a grade, yep. you how to do it, I've got to grade it, and that's all there is to it. Yep. Points well taken. And I would say it's all about the design. So um, the class that I refer to, the history and film class, uh, 250 students and we were doing this work um, really actively. But it took some time for me to think through, and I had help with this, I didn't do it on my own, um, to think through how could I align my outcome so that, that you know, key outcome of I want students to learn to think historically with the learning activities that, that I was engaging them in and then the assess assessment strategies that I was using. And what I realized um, with some feedback from others um, 
is that I really needed to model that practice because they weren't coming in knowing how to do that. And so I designed the, the lectures such that I modeled for them the kind of thinking I wanted them to engage in. I gave them time in class to reflect on and I provided feedback in a way that made sense. So I will admit the first time I taught it, I had them reflecting every class, well, 200 students, you know, times 12 weeks of classes. I nearly died. Um, you know, I got through it, but I thought, that was not the best approach. So I you know, went to um, beginning, middle, and end reflections with some other kinds of activities built in there. So it's really about thinking through how much time do you have, how much support do you have, um, what kinds of activities you need to engage them in so that you actually will know that they're building these skills to meet the outcomes, um, and what kind of assessments will you use to gauge did they get there. Um, in my world, when I teach using portfolios and courses, the portfolio assignment all together, so I have assignments that go into the portfolio along the way as they're developing um, those abilities and documenting their learning um, that results in a culminating activity. All that stuff together is usually worth about 60% of their grade. So they know this is really important and this is a central part of what they're doing in my class so that, you know, so that it's all kind of, of uh, measured out. So happy to share some of those designs with you. I would say the folks um, in uh, academic innovations will, are certainly happy to help. Um, Heather is an instructional designer and others, so um, I, I would say work with others, get feedback on that design, and, and start small. I mean, you don't have to change your whole class all at once. Um, you know, maybe it's just integrating a reflective assignment that meets an outcome that you already have to get them to sort of start that thinking. So there are lots of different ways you can do it. Are you still it. using midterms and finals? Um, I, you know what, um, early on I was still using a midterm and um, final. I got rid of the final pretty quickly because the portfolio became the culminating activity. Um, um, I, did, I have continued to use midterms in some contexts where I have large classes as a way to check in with them. Um, but I have really changed altogether the, the kinds of assessments that I use. Um, and I know for sure they're still, do they're still developing the abilities that they need to have at the right moment in time in their, whether it's a history degree or another degree, because I've built that in. Um, for instance, I don't necessarily have students write the full research paper. I might have them do, you know, come up with a really good thesis argument because maybe at that stage of learning that's all they need to develop. Some of my colleagues think that's abhorrent behavior though on my part, right? Because, you know, for them that paper is really essential and it really has to fit with your own philosophy and what you value as a teacher and what you value in your discipline. Yeah. The way that we've handled hundreds of students is through the efolio thinking paper. Mm -hmm. And they use the efolio thinking strategy to select, collect, reflect, connect, respect through their references, for example. And they all do that. First they were doing it weekly. Then they do it for the whole year. But what does that mean now? And you get a really good sense of did they get the bigger meaning rather than the simple conce key concept meaning. So we use the structure, the e-folio structure, as a form of pedagogy in the classroom. So it's not just a, a I, I, I understand that part. Yeah. It's the practical time, is, life is short, and you don't have the time yeah. to reflect on 28 pages of e-portfolio. No, it's not great pages. Well, no. okay. No. It's two pages. It's, it's more. Condense. The whole no, class, they, yeah. they condensed to two pages? They condense it down, yeah. I don't want to read that 28 pages. For they more. already have a, a term paper. I don't need to read. I'm looking, did they get it? You can look. You, you know, in two pages, you can... But why couldn't you do that in a final exam and have them write a two-page essay to well, question three? there's specific things that I'm looking for. And do you grade rubric? those specific things? Critical thinking. Do you have a rubric for that? Yes, I have a rubric. All right. I, I spend too much time in your office. <laughs> well, and in light of um, the time that we have, here's another question. I just had one question. You know, th this is a great shift of moving towards um, individual learners. But when we start to think about um, evaluating the program or the course, uh, could maybe you or Helen speak to you know ways in which we synthesize these individual e-portfolios into, you know, is, is our program working? Is the course effective? 
those ideas. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, there are lots of universities that are doing really good work on that front. So they're really sampling um, evidence from across the program to sort of say, are, are we seeing evidence that students are meeting the outcomes? And again, I like the portfolios for that and using really clear rubrics too so that everyone's assessing the same thing. Um, and I like that approach because it gives you some reliability and validity of are we actually doing the right thing? And it also shows you, you know, and, and we've done it in a program that I taught in where we had <laughs> a introductory e-portfolio work, a milestone in a third year course, and then in the capstone, we could pull evidence of portfolios from the capstone students and say, did we, are we hitting the mark? And we can see pretty quickly whether there are, are gaps and then go back to those individual courses and instructors to make sure that we're, we're really addressing. And I think that the infusion of a portfolio through a whole program allows you to sort of track formatively how are we doing um, in the whole program so that you can kind of catch things along the way. Um, and, and actually we got to the portfolio in a curriculum redesign because we realized we didn't really know whether students were meeting the, the um, desired outcomes at the end of our program. We wanted to be really sure that we were turning out students who had developed those, those abilities. Helen, do you want to add in from other universities? Yeah, I, mean, I think the example I would point you to is uh, Portland State University. Yeah. They have a really fantastic general education program that is really um, part of their university studies program that really is looking at more of an outcomes based rather than a traditional, you know, take two classes in science, two classes in humanities and that kind of thing. Um, our colleague Kevin Kelly, who used to be at San Francisco State University, really talks about, um, as, as uh, Tracy alluded to, this alignment among, let's say, the institutional uh, learning outcomes to the, pr uh, to the school, to the department, to the program, to the, um, to the course, and then down to the actual assignment that you're going to give to a student that's going to produce this evidence that you're then going to hold up and evaluate using a rubric around um, you know, quantitative literacy or something like that. So I think that alignment is really critical if you're going to say, how does this portfolio represent where we think students are um, in this program or along these various competencies? Any other questions? We're, yeah, and we're right about at 1230, so if anyone has to leave, uh, we understand. Thank you. But if you can stay and bear a few minutes, that would be wonderful. Um, this will be just very quick. Um, I've really enjoyed both of the talks. The focus has been on student, students. We're students too and we're learners. Yes. And one of the things that I'm interested in as a faculty member in addition to my classes and my students is how we can apply e-portfolios to faculty for our files for retention, promotion, and tenure and other areas of our lives as well, because primarily we're learners as well. It's a journey, just like your portfolios are. It's a journey, not a destination. That's such a great point, and I think um, we really, if we're gonna do this work, ought to be modeling the kind of thinking we wanna see in our students, so I think you're absolutely right. Building it into all of those other processes that we engage in as faculty members is really important, and I think Heather can probably speak to the work that's happening here in terms of P&T portfolios and things. Well, and I'll say there's a couple things that have been going on. One of the big things is I just started kind of an initiative for faculty, but building your online presence as a faculty member using the e-portfolio system. One, because we often work, you know, in our little silos. People don't, our own colleagues don't know what we're doing often, you know, let alone administrators and, and things along those lines. So in order to promote ourselves, our work, our department and the work that comes out of our department, um, I'm encouraging faculty to meet with me. I've already had a few workshops, a few more will be coming up about that because I think that's really important to start kind of setting the bar. Plus one of the big things that has come out of ePortfolios is they've looked at students who have bought into portfolios and used them and succeeded with them and one of the big things that the research has come out when they surveyed those students and said why, they said faculty buy-in, the faculty saw value in it and the, facul the faculty transmitted that value back to the students, and they saw that, and so how do you do that? It, well, part of it is by crafting your own. The other is, as some of you have probably heard, and there's a few people who are part of the pilot program um, in the room already, but we do have a promotion and tenure electronic portfolio that we've been working on as a pilot program. We've also set up, and I'm finalizing the, the flow tomorrow um, for an the electronic review itself, actually. So it won't just be even an electronic 
portfolio, but the review process will go through electronically. <coughs> and so those are just a few things already. Um, I've also been meeting with different um, faculty members and or departments. I'm taking some of my courses and putting them into a portfolio and things along those lines to see how that could work in those kinds of ways. So starting to really weave that personal and that academic side kind of all together in order to put it back out there, which is exactly what we're asking our students to do if we're doing this. But trying to tie all those pieces and parts together. So yeah, it's happening. It's going to become more and more relevant because as a peer review member of many committees where I review these files, those files that are better organized are much easier with regard to promotion and tenure and so forth compared to a file that shows no reflection. No, and in fact, it was over the years we didn't have reflection before. We started having self-reviews, and that was a step in the right direction. But I've seen the difference, how easy it is to promote someone who has done the kind of, so it is an exercise you need to learn to do, and you get better and better at mm -hmm. doing it as you do it regularly. If you don't do it regularly, and you wait for your six year or three year review process, it's a mess, and you don't know what to do. So you've got to do this on a regular basis, almost monthly. Yeah, and I would say it's also important too. I mean, we ask our students, when I say vulnerable, I don't mean like let's get together and hug kind of thing in a portfolio, but we are asking them to, to pull these different identities, these different selves together. And for students, that it might be uncomfortable because you know this is my student identity this is my home identity this is my cultural identity right we have all these different identities and so for asking our students to do that i know a lot of times as you know a faculty member i i don't want my students to know all these things about me and i'm still not revealing you know my deepest darkest secrets right um but i might start to weave in the personal in some of that, you know, maybe my extracurriculars, where I vol do volunteer work, my research interests. And so we become more human as well. And so we want our students, you know, understanding their process through review, you know, and reflection. It's nice to go through that process too, so then we can relate that, okay, this might be different. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for coming. I hope it's been useful. Certainly happy to have further conversations online or Skype or whatever would be helpful and um, wish you all the best in your ePortfolio pathway that you undertake. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Thank you.